explored from that teaching why God is telling us to go and wonder about the universe. Let's go. What did the Greeks know? What did the Hindus know? The Romans, the Persians, the Byzantines, the Chinese. They tried to accumulate as much as possible. The Greek philosophy, science and technology was even dead at that time. They resurrected it. They revived it. They translated the work back in Arabic. And then when everything is translated, do you know what they did? They started producing their own contribution to science and technology and literature and culture, ethics and morality. You have you, all the avenues, they started naming the stars. That's why you find, well, difficult to find, I, I take back sometimes because they have Latinized the names of the scientists. Avicenna, Averos, does it sound like Muslim to you? It doesn't, because Ibn Sina, if I said Ibn Sina, you'd say oh, Ibn Sina is an Arabic name. Averos, even Rush, but they've Latinized it. And because of this Latinization of the knowledge that took place, that's why the West, in general living today people, they don't appreciate the Islamic contribution to science and technology. Did you know in medicine, Ibn Sina's medical textbook called Al-Qanun Fi At-Tib, it's called, known as the Canon, went through 17 editions, at least in Europe, as a textbook, over a few hundred years in Europe as a medical textbook. This is the level of contribution they made, that it went for hundreds of hundreds of years as a textbook. A textbook written today is outdated next two years. Back then, the contribution they made in terms of whether it's a surgical instrument, whether it's optics and optometry, chemistry, you name it, it was there to last a long time. So we don't consider it to be antithetical and totally contradicting these two fields of knowledge. When you talk about epistemology, Quran addresses us to be inquisitive, to, to know, to, to understand and to reflect. And even it says, do they have hearts that is closed, that don't want to ponder and reflect? You know, what's wrong with them? So when we talk about agnosticism, if you want to suspend your judgment into, I am not sure about whether a creator exists or not, because of lack of evidence or the non-clarity of evidence, we can try to help to have a discussion on that. But if you are saying like, I don't even see a possibility with the tools that we are using to know whether the creator exists or not, then the discussion has no meaning because there's no possibility of creating this equation. So it's very important first to understand what are we using? Our tools to ascertain the reality of something. For example, if I want to know how I look like, Am I going to look at this stone floor? It's not reflected. I cannot see my face in it. It's not the right tool to use. I need to use something that is shiny and reflected, like a mirror. If I want to see 3D of me, my back and so on, I need more than one mirror, because with one mirror I can't see everything, because I'm a three-dimensional being, like back, this front, back and so on and so forth. I do not believe that we have tools yet, but they will come at some point. Why, why is our current set of tools? Like, let me tell you some of the tools that we have. Well, to me, to me the tools that I have been presented Okay, sure, sure. I have seen. Which ones what are they? I've seen and what I've experienced have not convinced me. Which are the but tools? they will for sure convince someone else. No, no. They just have we, we want to know what tools that you have seen and it's not convincing. Well, I don't believe that Faith is simply not Faith isn't a tool. And Faith is what you then take in using the tools. You see, information is out there and you extract the information and you input the information, you say, that's my faith. Because you've taken those in faith. So I believe in God because I heard or I knew or whatever that there is a God and I've accepted the information. What makes you believe in God? I have tools because that's now jumping the gun. No, 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 that's jumping it. Let's address the the question of how an agnostic would arrive in answering that question or ascertaining the truth of that question. But I would like to know how no, no, a believer but arrives at believer has holistic approach. Many tools. What is, what is, what is the tool? Okay. The tools that we have, yeah. we have intuitive tools for intuition. Yeah. We have rational faculty, intellect and rationality. We can reason. We can use inductive reasoning, we can use deductive reasoning. Do you believe that all humans 
If they're using reasonable reason, they're reasonable. If they're not using reason, like I had a discussion earlier, I left that discussion because I felt like I was speaking to a brick wall. Then I said, that's not a reasonable discussion. So people need to use reason to have a reasonable discussion and you can say they're acting reasonably. And what is, what do you decide to ask? And hmm? who, who decides what's reasonable and what is reasonable? There are many things. We use lots of principles from logic and philosophy, language, for example, we would say there is a principle that is universally accepted by almost everyone apart from few individuals. It's called the principle of non-contradiction. Two things, mutually exclusive, cannot be true at the same time. Like say, you exist and you don't exist at the same time. I cannot accept that. It doesn't make any sense. It's not reasonable to affirm that at the same time you are existent and non-existent. Yeah? So that's a principle of non-contradiction. I cannot affirm someone is a married bachelor because I know what married means, I know what bachelor means. I, cannot, I say something is unreasonable when they say, oh, there's a triangular circle. They're contradictory within their own concepts. So we can use that principle as one of the ways to use our reason. Yeah? There are various other tools. We have testimony as our source of epistemology. No, 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 no. I'm generally speaking about how we can know about things and I'll be certain about it. When I go to a doctor, I don't first look at his or her certificate on the wall. Sometimes he's not even there, there because a locum doctor. And I take their medicine. I trust them that they have gone to a medical school, they had an exam that they had to pass, and they went through a registration process with the GMC if it's in this country, and they have passed that to now safely practice medicine without causing harm. So when that doctor, he or she prescribes a medicine to me for my ailment, my illness, I feel confident that I'm not going to get killed by it. On the contrary, I should get well. I took that testimony by faith because he's a doctor. The GP surgery says he's a doctor. She's a doctor. I use my testimony from them and I accepted it. This is one way of knowing. Science is based on testimony. How many scientific papers, when people bring and publish something, is repeated with same experimentation with every other scientist in every other lab? No. Maybe some tests and observe, and that's it. The rest of the scientific community takes it by trust to their testimony. So testimonial evidence is one type of evidence. Each of these tools has their scope and limitations. I'm not saying you use it in broad enough. Revelation. Well, with testimonial evidence, I should go back to that. Well, usually with, let's take a doctor example, usually also a reason that you take that medicine is because it has been used before. And there is, as you said, Not necessarily. A doctor can prescribe, like I work in a hospital, and we prescribe medicines that has not been used for that indication before at all. New medicines, novel treatments. Novel, totally novel. Patients dying, first line treatment fails, second line treatment fails, third line treatment fails, now we're trying to say, okay, might work fine. We have some in vitro or in vivo evidence in either, you know, you know we haven't gone through the clinical trials properly yet in human subjects. There seems to be something that looks like it's going to be safe in use and so on. We will try that. Phase one, for example, we do that. So not necessarily always. So yes, sometimes we can use something, but if they know that this doctor is a qualified doctor, in fact, the doctors that we work at, their even role is professor of experimental medicine. There you go, the title says it all. Oh. So they are experimenting on medicine. The patient, when they sign the consent, they know very well that this are the risks that are involved because we all know the true outcome. Even when a medicine is marketed, right? We collect information, even post-marketing surveillance. Yeah? Because we don't know all of it together. And then we develop and then we include in our SMC symptoms um, summary of product characteristics in which we tell you what are the side effects, the frequencies, is it common, very common, and so on and so forth. So that next time, if you have a patient, we want to use that medicine, we'll say, ah, this is contraindicated in a specific disease uh, or a uh, organ specific indication. Like someone's got a weak heart or weak kidney or weak lungs or what liver, we can't use that. We have to reduce the dose and so on and so forth, right? We do that all the time. How so, do you use that? How do you that you assure yourself that God exists, that so testimonial evidence 
is used when we get this information from an individual who claims to be a prophet of God or messenger of God and we have no reason to doubt about this claim and the same at the same time that individual I'll explain that individual at the same time brings evidence for support of his claim so for example if we find someone in all of his life never lied always spoke the truth whether he's young or at the very stage in everyday interactions we've never seen an individual like that person speaking untrue always spoke the truth always reliable truthful trustworthy and reliable and now he says to you I am telling you God has made me a prophet to tell you worship God alone why should we immediately disbelieve in him by rejecting his statement to be untrue because we know him already he never speaks the lie at all because his life has been consistently of a truthful individual so to say he lied is now opening an avenue to say why why would we do that we start now we have to really be critical and say what could be the reason that he's lying if you cannot find any reason for his lying then you have to ask why am i dis disregarding it and if he brings at the same time evidence for his claim then these testimony and the evidence at the same time back up with each other of what is claiming to be true because you have to either say okay he's a liar and have all these motives or he's actually what he claims to be or, or yeah yes he could believe good he could sincerely believe that he was a prophet right meaning he was deluded in thinking that he was a prophet so now very good so we can in, in so this is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's talk about him. We can apply, yeah, yeah. We can talk about, is it possible to say that he was deluded um, in terms of what he claimed and what he preached and what he brought as the Quran? If we find someone's deluded, would he then claim to know about science and metaphysics and astronomy and biology and botany and economics and anthropology and X, Y, and Z? Because a deluded person is just simply deluded. He doesn't have the understanding of critical thinking of to have the, the sanity to say that, yes, I am actually in my sane sense. As a person, hmm? as a person, you can make yourself believe all of that. So, and still think that you're rational. Yeah, you can and think so. You can think so. Then you have to ask yourself, how does he then talk about inter-oceanic waves? He's never been to sea. His people have witnessed that he's never been to sea. But he's talking about the existence of inter-oceanic waves and darkness within this deep sea. A deluded person is not someone who goes and studies. That's not delusion because you will not be deluded anymore. You will be enlightened with knowledge. You will not be called deluded. But he's coming up with information that goes against any concept of being deluded. He's talking about something like the universe is such that the earth and everything beyond this earth was actually joined together as one piece and then it parted it and it's expanding and then it will contract back. Now a deluded person to make things like that when the dominant understanding at this time was the universe is static, it doesn't expand, it doesn't contract. Why is he making these things? Where is he getting this from? Not from his contemporary culture and science and technology of this time because they don't even know that themselves as we have now learned about the red shift the cosmic background radiation hubble telescope we are now observing and confirming that the universe the stars are receding from each other they're actually expanding so at one point it wasn't as it's now so they go extrapolate back 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 to a point where there was absolute singularity such a minute singularity of condensed space and whatever that is what Quran is describing at one point it was like one and there was a separation and that's what they're explaining about the inflation theories of big bang and inflation but it doesn't stop there it says it will be rolled back like a scholar's roll there are a lot of scientists talking about now the fate of our universe because gravity is such strong what's going to happen to the universe is it going to keep on expanding or is it going to come back right science is now dealing with this question a deluded individual 
coming up with something so profound that today we cannot disregard that this is something that is untrue. He said something which now we are saying, yeah, that, is, that makes sense. Now we go through with all the submarines or go in space and look at the interoceanic waves. You know about deep sea currents. You can't just simply observe them with a dive, with a diver. Because you have the oceanic waves, but deep down, they are sea currents, sometimes in the opposite direction. They are like waves within the oceans. The Quran is talking about this whole existence of these waves. How does he even know that? He doesn't have a submarine, but he's talking about it. He's talking about someone be, be there. Light passes through and there's darkness and flares until there's total darkness. Now we know that's the case. There's total darkness and we are surprised that within the total darkness there are creatures, fish, whatever, they have their own light source. Yeah? So how does he know that this is the thing, you know, in our natural phenomena? How does he know the common origin of, 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 of a matter and cosmos is like this? I've given you two examples. So this is not as great many, I don't want to bore with examples, but to illustrate to you, someone who's deluded can be easily excluded by looking at the, what he has brought. It's not a sign of delusion. A deluded individual cannot bring you something like this and be so coherently explaining I'm explaining things going against the status quo of the scientific community and then says it's this. They're saying the earth is flat, the universe is static and the Quran is saying no it's not the case. What gives him that competence and confidence and knowledge base to make that information? So when we talk about testimonial evidence and we examine the life of the prophet, if we consider to be not him to be a prophet, he must have some motive for his. You make one motive which is sincerely deluded in thinking and that's why he's saying I'm a prophet. But all the things that he's coming up with, it goes against a deluded individual. What could it be? Could it be that he wanted to have fame, authority, rulership, kingship? He wanted to be the, the leader. He wanted to have money and wealth. He wanted women. Guess what? All of that was offered to him. All of that was offered. He said, if you want to be the king, we'll make you the king. Because what happened was, as he persisted in telling people to worship God, avoiding worshipping the idols, their whole economy was being shattered. Because their economy, out of all of the things, is based on people coming in to have pilgrimage, bringing in money and homage and so on. It's a thriving economy of the Meccan pagans. And He's saying, no, there are no 360 idols. There's only one God. So all of them are false, redundant. So, hmm? jinns, what are jinns? Do you believe in jinns? Yeah, exactly. So if you don't believe in jinns, how can you then bring a jinn to be an, a, a, a cause for all of that? Because you yourself are not sure. If you are sure about the jinn, I can tell you, even the jinns cannot do certain things. They have their own limitations. Jinns are not divine beings. They are agents with reason, will, uh, or, or faculty of choice. Either they accept or reject and so on. They may have certain advantage for being before us to have certain advantages in terms of technological advancement in their eyes, in their special avenues, because they're not like in our same dimension that we are like this. They operate in a different level. We can't see them. They, they may see us, but they have limitations. Even then, the Quran actually says at one point, if the jinn and the humans came together, together, if they came together, to produce something like the Quran, they will never be able to do so. Yeah? So, the jinns themselves do not have the capacity, and the Quran says, they say, Shaitan or Shayateen or Satans have inspired and revealed it. The Quran says, they have nothing about this. They have they have not the ability and the capacity to do so. Okay? And the Quran even says this is not the works of Shaitan. Okay? When you read the recite the Quran, seek refuge with Allah from the accursed Satan. So the Quran is saying it's not from Satan. Take Satan in the Take him as your open enemy. Don't follow. Don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. So we know that it cannot be the products of shaitan. 
his motives of being the kingship which he was offered, he rejected. Money and wealth, he rejected. Women, he rejected. So, what is his motive? We lost in every possible way of thinking what his motives could be. Oh, did he want a moral reformation? How can he unite someone with this moral reformation? He's telling him, you know, he says, For what reason was that girl that was buried alive? Because they have a practice of burying the daughters alive. But why? Now, this was the status quo. And you go against it, they don't want to like it. So, if you want to, you just imagine, to give you a mundane example. The king of England, in his parliament, decides next week we are going to bob, we are going to ban every single pub in this country from next week. No cigarette manufacturers can make any cigarettes, no one can consume any cigars, no one can alcohol drink, nothing. Do you think they will be able to pass that law through legislation? No. There will be uproar. They will overthrow King Charles. They will overthrow the parliament. Because it goes against the status quo, the, the wishes and dictates and the desires of the people which is so ingrained. So something like this was within the Arabian culture belief system. The prophet came to overthrow that. If he was to unite them, he shouldn't be using that tactic because it's not going to work. Why is he saying like, oh, he, want, he wants to unite the Arabs? And guess what he said? Maryam, a Jewish lady, she is the, the best woman of the world. The best woman. What would the Arab going to think? You are now saying a Jewish person is the best woman of the world and you want to unite us? They're not going to unite. So the Quran, the way in his life and what he brought demonstrates that the motives that people brought, motives of wealth and fame and honor and glory, kingship, rulership, unity of the Arabs, moral reformations, none of them works. Some people even came and said, you know what, he had seizures and because of epileptic seizures, he came up with all this information. Oh yeah, since when through our epileptic fits, we are getting something so profound with scientific information? Maybe. No, 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 no. I said, my, my, if you ask me, my approach is holistic. I am saying, the reason why the prophet of God, I can give you enough reasons for you to think and contemplate, and you can tell me why you agree or disagree. And I can give you other ways, other epistemological tools in which, because if I give you from every single angle, you, are no, you have no way to escape, but to say, that's it, you've closed all the avenues. But if I give you, you know, a window, that's where you, you tell there's another window, let me come out of it, because I have an, a, a, um, an argument against it. Islam gives us these kind of evidence and arguments in which it's multifaceted. So the Quran says, for example, I'll give you something about the existence of this world and, and the, uh, the origins of matter. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on now. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Do you not want to know why agnosticism can be made clarified to lean towards with certainty that there's a creator? Because that's what I was getting at. Maybe five minutes? Okay, that's fine. Okay, you take care. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.